Now this message is born out of something I heard a few weeks back when we studied that wonderful hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. I pondered what it meant, that one of Christ's names was wisdom. And I wondered how that reality could and should inform my spiritual walk. If you remember that line, O come, thou wisdom, from on high, and order all things far and nigh. To us the path of knowledge show, and cause us in her ways to go. And it's this aspect of our Lord's identity that I would like to explore as we enter a new year full of surprises. Some will be welcome. Others will be painful and unpleasant. But it will be a new year in which we will not walk alone. Today we'll see that Christ is the incarnation of wisdom and that as his people, we can appeal to this divine wisdom, this ever available gift, whenever we choose. And of all that we have in Christ, right, we have forgiveness. He's our intercessor. He's our advocate in heaven. He takes away the fear of death, the freedom from sin, all of those things. I say that it is his wisdom that seems to me most to be the gift that keeps on giving. That's how I've titled this talk today, the gift that keeps on giving. Now, biblically speaking, wisdom does not mirror how we might expect it does in society. Our collection of wisdom texts, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and Job, uh, they have far more to do with exercising um, ethical and practical skill as we go about our daily routines, far more than it does with intellectual ability. That is to say, biblically speaking, wisdom is not about um, mastering cold logic or rhetorical skill or pure reason as we go about serving our own needs. Now, to be sure, these cognitive talents do have their place, uh, but the wisdom that God commends is the kind that embodies his character in a broken world. And wisdom's great advantage is that it preserves the life of those who practice it. Let's take a brief look at this claim in our wisdom texts. We start in Proverbs. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Again, chapter 3. Long life is in her right hand, wisdom's right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Again, chapter 3. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. Wisdom is personified in Proverbs 8. For those who find me find life and receive favor from the Lord. Finally, Ecclesiastes tells us that wisdom is a shelter, as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this. Wisdom preserves the life of those who have it. Words to contemplate as we enter the new year. Now, Paul's letter to the Colossians, for me, is a great place to begin our quest for wisdom because the letter features a lengthy prayer right at the start in which the apostle asks for the believers to be filled continually with the knowledge of his will through the wisdom and understanding which the Spirit gives. We'll see why that was so important for this particular body of believers who were getting blown about by certain practices which had the appearance of wisdom, but actually indicated that they didn't fully grasp what they had in Christ. They weren't quite sure who he was either. Let's ask for God's blessing as we open our text in Colossians. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, we come to you this first day of the new year seeking your help and knowing that you will in fact give us wisdom. You will give us ability to do all that you call us to. I ask that as we open your word now, we would have insight and understanding, that we would have a heart to walk with you as you bring about maturity in our lives. Thank you for the gift of Christ's advent and for him being our Emmanuel, God with us. 
We need this assurance as we enter into another year. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's turn now to Colossians chapter 1. And I will read this opening prayer. It begins in verse 9. And I will continue through verse 12. Colossians 1, 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. I'm not sure how your prayer life is, um, but I want to state at the outset that praying scripturally is an effective way to boost our prayer life. The text here provides the content that we'll pray, the words, the concepts, the imagery that Paul was moved by God's Spirit to pray for other believers. And we can follow his example. Lord, please help Andrew and Mary to have great endurance and patience as they bear fruit in every good work. Thank you for qualifying Aaron and Nicole to share in the inheritance of your holy people. And maybe now we need to pray for great endurance and patience as Dan puts his Rubik's Cube together. But if this, is, if this is all we did in the new year, if that's the only thing that changed that we prayed scripturally, I think we could count on a renewed intimacy with the Lord and each other. Many of you already pray scripturally, and you've seen the impact both in yourselves, how you've benefited, you've seen others, and how they've benefited from your prayer life. Now, Paul is in prison when he writes this letter, and we see that he has not stopped praying for the church in Colossae. As he prays, he asks that they be continually filled with the knowledge of God's will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. This phraseology is significant. New Testament writers often extracted Old Testament passages either verbatim in a quote or through allusions to the Scriptures where they might mirror some of the language, some of the structure, some of the ideas or imagery. And this would be intentional. In this case, Paul is combining the idea of the Spirit filling someone or something, and he's using that concept with his threefold wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, right? The only other places that that, um, that algorithm appears, if you will, in the Old Testament are in Exodus 31, as the people prepare to build the tabernacle, right? God is going to fill these, uh, these people to make the furnishings, the instruments. We also see it in the temple construction in 1 Kings 7, where Solomon's presiding over the first construction of the temple, and his foreman, the king of Tyre, will be filled with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. But let's look at those, let's look at those Old Testament allusions, and it might give us a flavor for what Paul has in mind as he's thinking of this church. He's thinking of what they need more than anything. And I think he has a building project in mind. So in Exodus, I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skill. Again, this was for the tabernacle in the desert. In 1 Kings, we see that Hiram was filled with wisdom, with understanding, and with knowledge to do all kinds of bronze work. He came to King Solomon and did all the work assigned to him. Now, this example doesn't mention the spirit that's implied, but both in Exodus and in Kings, and as Paul will pray in Colossians, we've got filling by the spirit and that trifecta, wisdom, knowledge, understanding. I think he's got a building project in mind. If you participated in our recent Connection Hour class where we looked at how the New Testament uses the old, you might recall that Paul viewed the life and health of the New Testament churches. He looked at them through the lens of Israel's progression, 
from captivity in Egypt all the way through the wilderness wanderings and into the promised land. This was his template for understanding what the church was doing, what it needed, um, and it's really its overall health and well-being. And there are many parallels between the nation of Israel and the various churches we read about. Um, and we can't go into all those now, uh, but to suffice it to say that, that Paul is hearing what's happening in Colossae, and it brings to mind episodes from Israel's past in which they go about the construction of these meeting places where God's full presence is going to dwell, right? The tabernacle and the temple. That's what he thinks of as he hears about the status of the church. Now, by the way, I didn't come up with this. I'm leaning heavily on uh, G.K. Beale and D.A. Carson as they, s they specifically look often at how the New Testament uses the Old. Right? These aren't my ideas, but they're very helpful. And we'll come back to this notion of wisdom and construct constructing a home for God's fullness to dwell in a minute. Now, the fact that Paul's letter to the Colossians has so much to say about wisdom is chiefly because the church has bought into a version of wisdom which actually worked against their true identity in Christ. We see that what it is that will Paul reprimands them for, um, and when we read those words, we, we realize that he wants them to be filled with wisdom and knowledge that the Spirit gives instead of what they're pursuing. His goal is for the believers to mature in their faith, to live a godly life with skill, right? There's our definition of biblical wisdom. But he sees that they can't get there with the counterfeit wisdom. Let's see what prompted his response. And we're getting this from chapter 2 of Colossians. It's just one after the other, these indictments of what he's hearing. Verse 8, we start, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. In 16, therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Verse 18, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen uh, and they become puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. Finally, we've got a nice summary statement in 22 and 23. This do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, these things they were implementing. These rules which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use. Those things are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Paul's addressing the ascetic lifestyle, this rigor that the Colossians has, have embraced, and, and they're thinking that through this great discipline, they are going to perhaps increase their spiritual standing. They might have more and better access to what they think they already or what they should know that they already have. Using our Christmas, our Christmas gift analogy, this idea of, of, of gifts and, and what remains wrapped and still under the tree, this unopened gift that keeps giving, we could say that these spiritual upgrades which the Colossians sought were like the shinier spiritual toys uh, or the trinkets, but those weren't worthy of their identity as Christians, and it could never really satisfy them. And so, similarly, Paul would rebuke the Galatians for entertaining similar uh, religious temptations. He will say in chapter 4, You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I've wasted my efforts on you. What an indictment for the church. But throughout the whole time of their experimentation with these festivals and dietary regulations, the visions, the attempt to commune with intermediary celestial beings, they had the fullness of God's wisdom in the person of Jesus at their disposal. The gift remained wrapped, but it remained under the tree. It was ready to be opened, but they were distracted. Now, a bit earlier, I asked you to bear in mind 
this concept of the tabernacle and temple construction, I, I mentioned that those were places where you would go to commune with God. Holy places. The language of Paul's prayer harkens back both to the wilderness generation as they prepare their tabernacle. It also um, brings to mind uh, what Solomon is doing in building this temple, this home for God, where they could accommodate God's present presence on a permanent basis. And so these very, very specialized skills would require filling by God's spirit because they required wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Um, and as stated, the purpose of these structures was to house or contain the fullness of God's presence. Totally unheard of in ancient Near Eastern culture where a deity would actually want to be with his people to love them, to instruct them. But as the creator of mankind, as our relational God is, he wants to be among his people. The incarnation, which we just heralded during the Advent season, that's clear evidence of this reality. Similarly, at Pentecost, we have further proof that God enjoys dwelling with his people. Hark the herald angel sings remind us that Jesus was pleased as man with men to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel. Earlier in chapter 2, verse 16, we saw that the Colossians were imposing these regulations for religious festivals, new moon celebrations, and Sabbath days. We also have, in a sense, an unholy trinity there. This triplet is only elsewhere uh, seen in Old Testament contexts featuring temple worship. Specifically, the idea behind these customs was ritual purification and preparation to enter God's presence. But where they appear in Isaiah, God isn't impressed. In fact, he says that while you're saying the right things, your lips are near to me, your hearts are far from me. And so it's in those contexts that we see religious festivals, new moon celebrations, and Sabbath days, the words that Paul wants to use specifically. And so the fact that they were adhering to this um, outdated regulation, Paul would call them a shadow of the reality in Christ, that showed that they didn't quite understand the access that they now had in the Savior. In fact, he would go on to label those traditions as man-made and destined to perish. Moreover, this is hard to hear, he recognizes that the attempt to secure God's favor or to enhance one's spiritual standing through religious practice is actually inspired by what he calls the elemental spiritual forces of this world, a category which he associates with demonic power in the heavenly realms. Both in Galatians, he'll do the same in Ephesians, right? That's what you're doing, church, he told the Colossians. Instead, he wants these people to be continually filled with the knowledge of God's will through the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit of God gives, not filled with the counterfeit force that, on the surface, look very disciplined, very orderly, quite rigorous. Uh, but in terms of substance, he says, look, you're being blown about by hollow and deceptive philosophies. In the same way that we glean more of Christ's teaching, through the challenges and questions of his religious opposition, we similarly benefit from Paul's loving correction of the Colossians' ignorance. That is, had it not been for this very letter, we might not have some of these wonderful descriptors of our Savior. Here's what we learn about Christ from this four-chapter letter, thanks in part to the false teaching. We see in chapter 115 that the Son is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. In 18, he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. On to chapter 2. He is the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Finally, verse 9 and 10, we see that in Christ is the fullness of the deity. He lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. And I think Paul specifically saying that because this body of believers isn't quite sure they've got that fullness. 
still in search of some wisdom that might be out there. Maybe they've missed out on something. We saw earlier that the tabernacle and the temple was the place uh, that furnished God's fullness. It was there that he dwelled among his people, and so great effort was spent to make sure that he stayed to maintain his presence. We don't want to offend him. He might leave us. It was a place where he could be worshipped and petitioned, a place where his followers could gather and hear his teaching and be spiritually nourished, a place where his presence could be enjoyed. Now, along with this idea of wisdom, right, we enter in with the idea of fullness. That's one that Paul will repeatedly cite in the short letter, fullness. Now, given their misguided attempts to secure a spiritual maturity, the church needed to know that Christ was both the incarnation of wisdom and that he himself, in bodily form, contained somehow the fullness of God. Specifically in 119, we see that God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. <coughs> Secondly, in chapter 2, we see that in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. So again, with the fullness, with the wisdom, with the fullness, with the wisdom, you get a picture for what Paul's responding to. We only have one side of the conversation, but if he's using this, th this word and this imagery over and over, he's addressing something that the people were missing. They thought that they lacked fullness. They thought that they lacked wisdom. What I hear him saying is that with the advent of Christ and by virtue of Christ's earthly, earthly ministry, the tabernacle, the temple, had become obsolete. The purposes for which these structures were erected had already been eclipsed by the Lord himself. And all of the fullness of deity now resided in him. He's the image of God in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge dwelt. When he ascended, he sent his spirit to indwell his people. We celebrate the gift of Pentecost for that very reason. That is, the people who comprise his church, right? those in covenant with Christ, they are in fact the dwelling place of God. No longer is he inhabiting a physical structure confined to a geographic locality, say in Jerusalem, but he is to be found among his worshipers themselves. God's spirit inhabits his own people. This is perhaps why we read of the language of construction uh, and this idea of a, a building project that Paul has in mind. And, and he's going to differentiate the church from those who were harassing them or giving, this, giving them this false teaching, right? The language of building. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built, good construction words, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Now he's going to contrast that with those who are leading astray. Also chapter 2, they, your opponents, they have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Right? Construction language. Temp tabernacle, temple, the body of Christ building projects. Paul has in view their maturity as they would build. He's addressing those who actually constitute the divine dwelling place. It is they themselves who possess God's spirit and they would need wisdom, knowledge, and uh, instruction to carry on this task. By the way, all of you, he would say, have access to Christ's riches, all of his resources and power to live this godly life, this building that you're constructing. In fact, to the Corinthians, he would actually be explicit and say, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? Similar concept here. Now, the remainder of the letter, chapters 3 and 4, we'll just gloss over. Uh, and in there, he provides substantial guidance for living a life pleasing to God. So this is what wisdom would look like if they were to take his advice. But it is all premised, all that they would do, all this putting off of the old, clothing themselves with the new, all of that would be premised first on having an accurate view of themselves, right? They needed to know that their real life, who they really were, is hidden with Christ and God. This is how chapter 3 starts. <coughs> 
right? meant to encourage them. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Everything that would follow is premised on their identity here at the start of chapter 3. Their hearts and minds were to be anchored to that unseen reality, not the earthly realm, which remained entrenched in counterfeit power and substance, in false religion, as it were, even false religion with good motives. All the moral imperatives that Paul addresses would follow, but they were to be motivated by the greater reality of the believer's identity, that their life was hidden in Christ. And now Paul simply reminds them, as you live this life, remember, you have access to incarnate divine wisdom. It's at your disposal. As you grow up into this, as you pursue this, understand that that wisdom will aid your spiritual maturity. Maybe you're thinking, well, how do we fit into this letter? Maybe you're pondering the truths of all these texts that we've jumped around through. What does it mean for me? Well, I have three applications for us as we close. If you've been following along with the bulletin, you're probably desperate to fill in those blanks, and now would be the time to find a pen and pencil. The first suggestion I would make based on our reading is that um, if we want to make better use of wisdom in 2023, let's recognize our continual need for wisdom. Secondly, let's recognize that it is continually available. There's nothing stopping us from tapping into Christ in whom are all the riches of wisdom and knowledge. Twofold recognition that we need it always, that it is there always. What we mean uh, by skill for l skill in living, um, again, is this concept of biblical wisdom. Um, at any given time, as we enter the year, we're going to face challenges, things we don't have answers for. It's safe to say that we could benefit from wisdom. Uh, and again, that will aid us in living a God-pleasing life. The empowerment to do what Christ himself would do in our very situation. The book of James also treats this very topic, and in chapter 1, we see that God will not find fault with any of us for asking. He's going to give it generously because that's who he is. Verse 1, 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So that's our first piece of advice, that twofold recognition, that it's there always, that we need it always. Secondly, it speaks about how we go about pursuing it. The suggestion, be wholehearted in your pursuit of wisdom. Be wholehearted and ask the source. This falls in line with our two-stepped recognition above. We want to be wholehearted in our pursuit of wisdom, and so we ask the source. Note the urgency, the urgency with, with which the king, the father, instructs his son towards the opening of Proverbs, and really through the first nine chapters as he's introducing the value of wisdom for his future king. Proverbs 2, 1 through 6 says, My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will find understanding, or sorry, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. When I read that instruction from a father to a son, I have images in my mind from Luke 15, the succession of three parables, you'll recall. In every one of these three parables, we have an intense search underway. Someone's lost something and they've got to find it. Their whole essence is bound up with finding this object, the shepherd, the shepherd 
is going to leave his flock and find that sheep. We move from there to the woman who's going to sweep her house clean because she's lost a silver coin. Right? Her livelihood depends on that. Probably most, most familiar, Luke 15, these episodes of, of losing and finding culminate with the father who watches expectantly, watches out toward the horizon, hoping against hope that his son returns. And so there's an urgency present among all three searchers as they look for the sheep and the coin and the son. And we too can be wholehearted in our pursuit of what we've learned is life-preserving, life-giving wisdom. Finally, as we encounter God's wisdom all throughout our lifetimes, we do well to share it with others. We want to give and receive it, share it with others. Now, none of us is probably starting from scratch. There is an incredible amount of life experience in this very room. And every week as we gather here, you rub shoulders with each other. And there are people who have insight to the very issues you're facing. They're sad in your rows. They've watched God lead them through crises. They've also suffered when events didn't turn out as planned. Some of you have learned to manage conflict really well in a godly way. Others have learned how to preserve despite disappointments that are grave, setbacks. Others, you've seen a spiritual harvest as you've implemented some discipline in different areas as you've, as you've concentrated efforts in your specialties. And all of this experience has value for someone else that is seeking to follow the Lord. And so when we do call out for wisdom, as we seek him, what we might find is that he may lead you to someone in this room. As he did in first century Colossae, the Lord wants to build more and greater maturity into each of our lives individually and certainly corporately as a body. He's committed to that. That being the case, we want to be ready to share his wisdom with each other, both to give it and to receive it for our good and for his glory. We now reach the place in our service where we can respond to all that God has laid on our hearts. We prepare to commune with our great gift giver through the Lord's Supper. We remember Paul's words that it is in Christ himself that all the treasures, and, uh, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. That the Father is pleased for all his fullness to dwell in him. And that our very lives are hidden with him kept safe until he returns. May his wisdom steady and equip you for all that he has in store this year. May we, may we make good use of this gift that remains forever available to us. As I pray for us and invite the worship team back to the stage, my hope is that you would experience his wisdom afresh in this new year. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence this morning and for another year to walk with you. You have been so good to us in 2022, despite all the difficulties, many spoken, many unspoken. Lord, you have been good, and we want to thank you for that faithfulness. We're counting on you in 2023 to set out with us, to go before us. And my prayer specifically for these people is that you would continually fill them through your spirit with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and in all understanding. That they might live a life worthy of you. That they might please you in every way. Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. May this church be strengthened with all power according to your glorious might so that they might have great endurance and patience. May they give joyful thanks to the Father, to you who has qualified them to share in the inheritance 
of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Lord, finally, thank you that our lives are hidden safely in you, kept in your, kept in your care. It is in your holy name that we pray. Amen.